Oh, thank you very much for the introduction. I'm not just going to talk about medicine shortages. I'm going to talk a little bit um, about the reasons for medicine shortages, because I think that helps understand what's going on. And then a little bit about contingency planning for the dreaded B word, Brexit. And I'm going to finish up with a few um, self-help hints and tips. So hopefully that will fill the time. And I can never work out which... Ah. But we're so fed up of talking about Brexit, I thought I'd talk about cake instead. Um, because actually, if you think about when you're baking a cake, you might, you might have in your head that this is what you want and that's what you're going to make. Um, but I'm going to compare the production of medicines with um, making a cake. So there's lots of pictures of cake uh, here. So the first thing you've got to do is go out and get your ingredients. And there may be panic buying, which isn't at all helpful, really. And we can all, well, we probably can't all remember, um, I was uh, but a lass, um, the panic buying of sugar in the early 70s. And I, I can remember um, panic buying of yeast, of all things, um, from people who never even used yeast uh, in the 70s. And but sometimes the supermarket shelves get stripped bare um, for other reasons. If you have an, um, an unseasonably hot summer, um, very prolonged hot period, supermarkets have been known to run out of things like water, soft drinks, the, the barbecue meats. So there's all sorts of um, reasons for shortages. And actually it's the same in the pharmaceutical industry. But when we're thinking about the raw ingredients, we have to think that well, farming methods have changed over the years. So this is a, a very old-fashioned, nowadays regarded as inefficient method, method of gathering wheat. So years ago, there were lots and lots of very small enterprises scattered around the world. Um, and now we have huge automation. Again, that is very similar in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, so whereas in the past, if you had some small suppliers having problems with their crops, there was probably enough to go around. Nowadays, if major suppliers have problems, it does have a, a major impact on the um, chain in which you can um, buy things. And it, it gets down to a really basic level, actually, because um, years ago there was a shortage of morphine and it was simply because the factory had burnt down and there wasn't anybody else making the same product. So the reasons are many and complex. But say you can get a supply of wheat. Actually, you're not going to buy that infested stuff, are you? Um, so sometimes there's a quantity problem and sometimes there's a quality problem with raw ingredients. So you wouldn't make a cake out of that, but you wouldn't want to make your medication out of substandard ingredients. And again, with global supply chains these days, in the past, I would contend that more substances or raw ingredients of variable quality may have got through. Now, the MHRA checks all of the ingredients at source, and that includes going to India, China, other countries. So again, if they're not happy with a supply of a particular ingredient, they will say no. And sometimes these days, there may only be two or three people um, manufacturing that particular ingredient. So if one factory is closed down and, until they improve their methods, that again is something that can have an impact on the supply chain. So the other big change we've seen over the years is that Years and years ago, people would bake at home or go to a specialist bakery if they wanted to buy cakes. We've moved on. We have automation. Um, can you imagine if Mr. Kipling's just stopped production for a week? Actually, <laughs> it would be great probably for the health of the nation, but we're not here to talk about obesity. Um, you'd still probably be able to buy cake but you might not be able to buy your cake of choice if that was your cake of choice. I'd say go buy something better, but um, I do know Mr. Kipling sells an awful lot of supposedly exceedingly good cakes. 
And again, um, the parallel is large factories, large factories in pharma. Again, if anything goes wrong in one of those factories, such as the, the fire that I alluded to earlier, then there's a problem. But the other problem with the large factories these days is that they all work to this just-in-time manufacturing um, agenda. So if anything goes wrong, quite simply, you're stuffed. Now, I can never understand as a pharmacist, we know every year there's going to be a hay fever season, yet quite often the manufacturers get it wrong. And you're out of really basic eye drops that um, people with hay fever need. And this is because those predicting demands have got it wrong. If you have a really bad flu season, it's sometimes difficult to keep up with the demand with some products. Um, there's often a, a slot for your particular medicine. And that can cause problems because if, if for example, um, medicine A goes out of stock, I'm not going to talk epilepsy um, medicines at the moment, um, then alternatives may be uh, supplied. And obviously that puts a strain on that supply chain as well. So it's a very complex and actually quite a fragile system. But there are other factors that's pl at play as well. This is Marie Antoinette, famous for saying, let them eat cake. And um, in an aspirational world, everybody wants to eat cake, actually. And what's wrong with that? So in the, in the poorer countries, they may be eating cake, but the other thing that's happening, and this is a reverse of what was happening maybe 15 years ago, is um, as the poorer nations, particularly China, India, you know, Brazil, those sorts of countries, get wealthier, they expect a higher standard of living, and that higher standard of living includes access to drugs. So there's an increasing global marketplace, which again, does have an impact because the factories have to keep up with um, demand. So how do we share our cake? I mean, ye years ago in the medicines world, there were um, lots of well-meaning people campaigning um, for things like HIV drugs to be more available in the third world and actually drugs for other conditions as well. So whilst we've got better at that, that has also had something of an impact. And if you're a seller, whether it's cake or medicines, you're going to sell to the highest bidder. So if somebody comes along with higher purchasing power, they might decide to sell to them rather than the UK. And money talks, doesn't it? Exchange rates, believe it or not, also have an impact on medicines availability. And I won't labour this point because I want to get on to the Brexit bit. But when the pound is strong, what we see is, I wouldn't say a lot of foreign cake because we're actually <laughs> getting back to the medicines now, but you probably have seen medicines with um, foreign packaging overstamped with English, and they're called parallel imports. But when the pound is weak, there is an incentive for... Uh, some in the country to buy stock and sell it abroad. And it's very difficult to track. The manufacturers are, are trying very hard. Um, and it's very difficult to um, keep under control. And that it can be an issue with uh, some medicines, particularly um, if the medicine can be sold for a lot more abroad. So I've got to get to it eventually, and I've got to mention it, but here we are, Brexit. Yeah, sorry, um, cake's gone. Um, don't stop, Paul. So I thought it would be worth just talking for a few minutes about the contingency plans that have been going on, because at um, the Royal Pharmaceutical Society, we highlighted oh, over a year ago that we thought um, there could be problems because, as uh, many of you will probably know, there are existing problems with the shortages chain, which I, um, why I felt it important to explain that these things are happening anyway. Um, it's only now that people are blaming Brexit for things that have been ha happening for years. So um, the DH um, have responded and kept us in touch. Um, so one of the things that is going on, which you'll all probably have heard about, is uh, national stockpiling. So what they're trying to do is have six weeks' supply of each medicine. 
And if you think about the several thousands of medicines that come in from the EU, um, then tracking all of those is an absolutely mammoth task. So whilst everybody's trying hard, nobody can say hand on heart that there won't be a, a problem with something. So the stockpile is for six weeks. So the question we asked was, well, that's all very well, but is it just six weeks at the start? What if um, import problems can't be resolved? Um, that's a certain amount of uncertainty. So now they've said that the six-week supply of medicine will last, and they did initially say for six months, but effectively monitoring all the time, and they, that six weeks should be there as long as um, is needed. But there are a couple of ifs and buts here. Um, they've also written to the GPs and say, don't let people have longer supplies of medicines. And some GPs I know, because I, I do still work as a, a pharmacist, um, you know, at the, I say at the cold face, at the medicine space. Um, and some GPs are being very, very strict about not allowing people to have um, larger supplies of medicine. And that is right, because if everybody panics and tries to get an extra month, then that will cause problems in itself. So we, we do have to be really careful with what we do. It is noticeable, though, and this is only anecdotal, but a number of my colleagues tell me that there seem to be an awful lot of people getting extra um, medicines because they were going on holiday around the early March date for Brexit. So it could have just been a um, coincidence. There is going to be priority at the ports, and what we were told, um, recently there was a meeting of all the Royal Colleges, was that um, we'd be in a better position now if it's a hard Brexit than six months ago because the French have got their act together, uh, which seems slightly counterintuitive. But basically, there's a lot more space to pull the lorries to one side. The other good news, well, it's good news and a bit of bad news, is that they've introduced a, um, an IT system that will supposedly, if you've logged everything ahead of time, you've got your permission, you should be able to drive straight through. Unfortunately, the awareness of that system is not yet as great as they would like it to be. But that is a work in, in progress. Anybody stockpiling is allowed to um, have access to the extra warehousing that the government has put in place. And that includes areas of refrigeration as well. So if, I, if this was me talking to Diabetes UK, uh, they're really concerned about um, you know, the cold chain, um, no insulins made in this country. So you know, they have concerns that are slightly different to yours perhaps. One area some of you might have heard about, um, and this is really for people who are undergoing forms of chemo uh, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, diagnostics, is um, radioisotopes. Again, most of those come from outside the country, very, very short lives. So they're not um, taking anything to chance with that, and they're looking at picking them up, air freighting them over, and making sure there's a DHL-type delivery system. Now, I don't know if any of you have had problems with DHL. I'm not sure I'd choose it as the best example, but I think they were using it as an example of um, what they're aiming for. Um, there is supposedly going to be a media campaign, but time's getting a bit short. And we had a meeting, it, it was early August, and the comms team hadn't even met. But what was really clear to us was that all of a sudden there was a really renewed interest in looking at Brexit, looking at what would happen in a no deal. And that was the change of prime minister. They're, they are chucking a lot more money at this because they don't want anybody saying, we told you so. So um, at the end of the meeting, they asked us all if we were reassured that everything was in a better place. And we all just looked at each other and we could say, well, yes, things look better. But what was of concern was that a no deal looked more likely. And um, whatever you think about Europe, I think it is fair to say that there are more unknowns with uh, no deal. So one um, thing that has caused a lot of concern is a lot of the medicines these days, if they are um, being used in the UK under the European system, we had a reciprocal agreement. Anything um, being tested in Europe, we would accept. 
um, the MHRA, who are responsible for the standards of medicines, have actually said, don't worry, if it's been um, approved by the European um, Regulatory Authority, then we will accept that. So the, that concern is, is no longer um, real. You will be able to get the medicines if they've passed. And then there's something called the Serious Shortage Protocol, which has um, raised a lot of concerns, I think, particularly in the area of epilepsy. I completely understand that. And part of the problem was the press, actually, because what the Serious Shortage Protocol is designed to do is if, there is, if it is agreed that there is a national shortage of a medicine, the system kicks into place where um, we don't have to send you back to the doctor, the doctor has to think about what the best thing might be, um, and the you know, patient doesn't know what's happening, the pharmacist is trying to hold it all together, and the, the GPs, well, it's extra workload for them. So what this was dis designed to do was make the system smoother, if you like. So if there was a problem, there would be an agreement at a very high level at what the medicine substitute would be. The pharmacist would um, supply it, uh, it had to be explained to the patient, the patient had to agree, and the doctor would be um, notified. But the doctor would know that all the patients on drug A would be changed to drug B. Now, understandably, people who um, are living with epilepsy, who have complex re uh, medical regimes quite often, um, and sometimes it's taken quite a bit of trial and error to get them right, they've probably got more to lose than the average person. And I say this because, obviously, um, it's not just the health that's affected. It's if you have a seizure, if your seizures aren't um, controlled, then potentially you could lose your driving license, and that might affect your livelihood. So I completely understand that. But there are some areas where, actually... Um, this sort of thing happens informally anyway. So if it's a particular strength of a drug that we can't get hold of, nobody really worries if a 200 milligram tablet has to be made up with doubling up 100 milligrams um, because that should have the same effect on the body. Where it becomes more difficult is if you can't get a sustained release um, product, for example, because that is much more difficult to match. So I think it's fair to say that there may be some um, epilepsy drugs that are covered under the um, strength aspect of unavailability. But when it comes to swapping a drug or um, swapping a controlled release formulation, then I, I, don't, I honestly can't see that you can do that on a national scale. But for... Um, Somebody who's got high blood pressure, for example, um, there are many, many alternatives. But the reason the decision is going to be made um, at high level is because at the moment they're tracking really carefully the levels of all of the drugs in the country. So the last thing you want is to say, right, we'll switch drugs, and um, then people on the second drug have a problem. So there's a lot of things to be taken into account. And um, this, again, I, I sort of I think the press was scaremongering because actually what this was intended to be was something which took the hassle away from the um, patient. But I'm happy to answer any specific questions on that um, later. So the message really is uh, keep calm and carry on and, and eat cake. Um, so what can you do? A couple of things here. I would say don't, don't leave things to the last minute. I often work on a Saturday, and I work in different places. And I get so frustrated when somebody comes in, they've run out of their medicine, and um, we might not have it. And you're having to ring round, trying to find out which um, pharmacies in the area are open. You may not even be able to get it. You can get it Monday 
If they'd come in the night before, you might have been able to get the medicine for the Saturday. But um, please don't leave it to the last minute because it's not taking personal responsibility. I know sometimes things happen, but um, it, it's an increasing problem with people on all sorts of medicines that they just expect it to be there. And um, that's, again, pharmacies are keeping lower stocks of drugs these days for various reasons. So don't, please don't have a personal stockpile and keep, keep a, um, a buffer in so that you're not running to the pharmacy at the last minute. But it's actually antisocial to um, think, I'll just get myself an extra month's supply. You might be all right. But if everybody did that, there'd be a lot of people who weren't. So if you are having problems, then one thing you can do so is ask for a separate prescription. And some of you will probably notice that a lot of prescriptions are sent electronically from the doctors these days. But we still do operate the old green pad system. And the problem with the electronic system is you have a nominated pharmacy. And it's basically a faff to unnominate and send it somewhere else. And you've actually got to know where to send it. If you ask your doctor for a, a green prescription um, and you want to find out where it's available, you've then got the prescription, you can ring around, and then you can say, I've got a prescription, and the pharmacist will probably put it to one side for you. So um, that is um, an issue. One, and one of the problems we've had at the moment which, with shortages, which um, has, I think, worried quite a lot of people, is the repackaging of sodium valproate and epilim um, because of the um, trying to make sure that pregnant women don't take medicine inappropriately. That has actually caused um, a blip in, in supply as well. Now, things are better now, but they're still not as high a level um, in the stockpile as, as we would like necessarily. So the other thing I would say really is just ask your pharmacist um, for help. And I would also say that, I know they're pretty hard pressed these days, but um, they should be helping you source your medicine, particularly if you've got, and, and many do. And I would say, if you've got a pharmacist that's not doing that, there are plenty of others around, so go somewhere else, because um, you, you're not getting the service you really deserve. So that is pretty much it, really. It's a bit of a canter through, and I hope um, it's explained some of the preparations that are being made. Thank you, Sandra.